and I'm with the Secular Coalition for America. And we are very proud to kick off the March for Science Week of Action with our partners, uh, Every Child by Two, Vaccinate California, and Voices for Vaccines. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over in just a second to Amy Pisani to start us off. Uh, I just wanted to A, check that everybody can hear us, um, and to let you know that you can ask questions in the chat box. Uh, so just enter your, type your questions into the chat box, and we will either answer your questions as we go along or save them for the end. Um, if you can uh, chat to us right now and let us know if you can hear us just with a, a yes or a thumbs up, that would be great. And I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Great. Thanks, Sarah. I'm so excited to be here with my wonderful colleagues from Vaccinate California and Voice for Vaccines and, of course, the Secular Coalition of America. Um, what I was going to do is um, start out by um, pr providing basically a background on the events that have been happening um, around the country with regard to vaccine confidence. And um, Sarah, before I really go forward, I just wanted to make sure, is the slide for other people showing in full screen? Because mine is sort of boxed into different boxes. Um, I see it as um, box with different boxes, but I'm a presenter, so I think we should ask the attendees. Attendees, can you see a full screen, or are you seeing um, the kind of back end? Oh, they see the full screen, says Liz. Thank you, Liz. Okay, wonderful. Great, I appreciate it. Thank you. So I will keep an eye on the chat, but I'll try to take a couple breaks here and there. Um, it's hard to do, I was all know, a presentation and look at the chat, but I'll take a couple breaks and, and um, maybe when I take the breaks, then I'll, if you want to just throw some questions in, we'll do that. Of course, I, I don't want to go over on time and um, our partners have such great things to talk about, so I will we'll try to keep it concise. Um, for those of you who kind of know who we are, um, Every Child by Two, who we are, um, excuse me, I'm going to give just a brief background on, on us. And um, for those of you who know a little bit of the history on the um, vaccine front, I'm sure it's always exciting to hear it again. Um, but I do want to help clarify this for some folks who may be new to this issue um, and looking for ways that they can help um, facilitate educating the public and, of course, educa educating legislators at the state and federal level. So um, my organization is called Every Child by Two, and our mission um, expanded a couple of years ago. So we now protect families and individuals across the lifespan. We were originally called Every Child by Two because the theory was you should have your child vaccinated by the primary series by the age of two. Um, so we call every, um, Vaccinate Your Family the next generation of Every Child by Two. Um, our founders are Rosalind Carter, the former First Lady of America, and Betty Bumpers, who was the uh, First Lady of Arkansas back in the 70s, and then her husband was subsequently a senator for over 20 years from Arkansas. And they are probably the most wonderful people you would ever meet. They are incredibly passionate about vaccines, and they, um, they, do, they did all kinds of work back during their years as governor spouses to help pass the laws um, in their own states regarding vaccinations and really just to build coalitions in their own states. Um, later, when, they, um, when Mrs. Bumper's husband became a senator, she wanted very badly to try to work on this federally, but didn't really get a lot of support. But fortunately, her old friend, uh, Roland Carter, soon came to office. And so she was able to work with her to help has um, a nationwide focus on vaccines to really hone in on, on working on this at a federal level. They worked with the Health and um, Education and Welfare, which is now HHS, um, Secretary Joe Califano. Um, they actually helped pass the laws in every state that require mandating the proof of vaccination, that mandate the proof of vaccination before you can enter school. So they, um, of course, it's not a federal law. These happened at the state level, and um, having them in the White House was terrific because they went from state to state and helped to urge those laws. Um, this was an incredible um, thing that they did, and it's why we feel so passionately about ensuring that these laws are, up, uh, are upheld and that they are strictly enforced around the country. The other thing that they did was they um, traveled throughout the nation um, once they created Every Child by Two, um, so they left the White House in the 80s, obviously. Um, but then later in the 80s, there was a terrible measles outbreak that killed many children, and that's when they created Every Child by Two. 
And from there, they started building coalitions in every state. They, um, they literally traveled the entire nation and went to every state, most of them more than once, built the coalitions up, worked on more of the legislation, um, and just never stopped from there. We, um, our priorities are to educate the public about the importance of timely immunizations for people of all ages, and we collaborate with many partners at the national, state, and local levels. We do a lot of work with the WIC. Um, WICs actually have to screen vaccinations um, for every child during eligibility visits, and that's in part due to some work that Every Child by Two um, did during the Clinton administration. And of course, we work with all the coalitions. We serve as a source of accurate information to the media. Um, we've been developing relations with the media for many, many years, and um, a lot of them really became much more um, fruitful when the safety issues started. Um, that's when we really started developing some terrific relationships. It took a while, um, but I think the media is getting it now. And of course, our partners have a huge role in that as well. Um, we also work hard to keep providers and public health partners up to date. Um, we have um, exhibits at conferences. We disseminate our ECBT daily news, um, our news clips, um, our news alerts, a vaccine safety, um, I'm sorry, a vaccine um, monthly update, and, and many, many other um, things that I will actually show you during this. And of course, we advocate for pro immunization policies at the state and federal level. So the history of vaccine hesitancy, and there's a lot of names for this. Um, I'm going to stick with the lighter ones if I can. Um, but basically, for those of you who aren't aware of the whole background, it, it really all came to head um, pretty much in 1998 when um, Andrew Wakefield, who's pictured here on the right, um, published a study in The Lancet claiming that vaccines were causing autism, specifically the MMR vaccine. Um, for those of you who sometimes hear um, questions about thimerosal and vaccines, that's a whole other um, argument that is out there, but there was never thimerosal in the MMR vaccine. Um, so just to clarify, the, the questions really started coming forward in 1998. Um, you'll see in the middle, there's a picture of Dan Burton. That's the congressman from Indiana. Um, he held many hearings and have Andrew Wakefield come in, and it, it was all over the, all over the um, news, and it was really alarming. And I have to tell you, I was very pregnant at the time, and I sat through those hearings. And Andrew Wakefield sounded very credible. And it was, you know, it was back during the time when we didn't really have the studies yet to counter this misinformation. So it really started to bubble up, and it got a lot of media coverage. Um, at that, about that time, Dr. Sears came out with this alternative vaccine schedule that was supposed to make parents feel more secure and children be safer. Um, and subsequently, dozens of studies, of course, found that there was no link between the MMR vaccine or really any other vaccines and autism. And that's, um, if you see that link there on Vaccinate Your Family, we have a list of all the research that was done on that issue. And then in 2010, the General Medical Council, of course, determined that Wakefield had faked his data, had performed awful unnecessary medical procedures on the 12 children that were in his study. And um, he lost his medical license. Um, and, it, and then the Lancet also retracted the paper. But the damage was already done. Um, he was claimed to be an elaborate fraud, but people are still hearing from Andrew Wakefield, and we're seeing more and more um, children suffering from vaccine-preventable diseases. I have to say, much to his fault. So some more events that, that really started to bubble up at the time. Um, Larry King had, um, had appearances with anti-vax groups. He tended to pit them against um, scientific experts, but it became such a screaming match that it was very difficult to counter, to point counterpoint. If you look at Jenny McCarthy there, um, you know, that became a real screaming match, and it was very difficult for Dr. David Taylor, who's pictured on the right from the Academy of Pediatrics, to counter it without sounding angry himself. Um, she was, of course, on The Doctors, and she was on Oprah. Um, at the same time, approximately, um, Hannah Poling um, family did a press conference claiming that the federal government had conceded that um, Hannah's autism was vaccine-induced. But the truth of the matter was she was compensated for some symptoms that are similar to those symptoms that are seen in autistic children. But those symptoms are seen in many other illnesses as well, and she was not considered autistic. They never, the federal government did not concur that she had gotten autism from her vaccine. But that got a lot of press coverage as well. And then um, I'm not sure if everyone remembers this, um, this big um, federal case uh, 
called the Omnibus Autism Proceeding that was happening in 2009 and 2010. And that's basically where a huge number of cases were brought all into one proceeding. And um, the, the, the ju- there were two um, cases that were actually more specifically analyzed. They were, they were considered the case studies. And they were to see whether or not vaccines did, in fact, cause autism, whether NMR caused autism, whether thimerosal caused autism, or a combination of which could cause autism. And basically, um, in the end, the, the courts not only said that they, there was no connection, they, they were so clear on it, saying that it was this massive, um, not cover up, a, a massive um, effort to confuse parents and that there was absolutely zero possibility that it could be causing it. And some really interesting stuff came out of that, and you can see that on that link there, the omnibus proceeding. We have um, some press conferences that every child by two helps to educate the media, and um, a lot of the transcripts from those, from those cases are in there. Um, someone, Shep, is asking, did Hannah Poling get any illnesses from vaccination? Um, she was, um, there was a, they did compensate her. I, I really can't say that it was due to vaccinations, but as most people know, the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program has a much lower standard um, to adjudicate cases um, regarding vaccinations. So there's a lot that would go into to looking in that, and um, I'm more than happy if you send me an email. I can send you a lot of background on Hannah Poling. It's it's some really specific nuances to the illness that she did have um, that, again, the press just went wild with and said that she had autism. And you'll see my email at the end. Um, so more recently, what we've been seeing is, of course, um, there's been a lot of uh, presidential candidates that started talking about vaccinations, tweeting about vaccinations, and questioning vaccine safety, um, talking about the fact that there may need, be a need for more investigations as to whether or not there's a connection between vaccines and autism. So that really started to, um, you know, garner media attention all over again, even though it seemed like it had been quiet for many, many years, and I felt as though we were really overcoming this battle. Um, prior to the inauguration, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. met with President-elect Trump and Vice President Pence. And um, as many of you know, RFK um, claimed that he was asked to create a a chair, a new commission on vaccine safety and scientific integrity. A lot of different um, stories came out about that. But in the end, the Trump team has not commented on this, and they have not contacted RFK since. Um, RFK has said that he hasn't been contacted since. Um, Before the uh, inauguration, they said they would contact him after things were settled, and he has not um, been, been, been discussing it with them in any way. So we're hoping that that is sort of uh, water over the bridge at this point and that the Trump administration, just like any other group of parents, were just misinformed and they're catching up and they're getting up to speed now. I know I'm, I'm very rose-colored glasses, but that is what I'm working on. That's my thought process anyway. Um, what does concern many folks is that RFK has been getting more and more um, notoriety on this issue. And he was interviewed by Don, Don Imus, if you all remember Imus in the morning. Um, he was interviewed a couple of weeks ago on that show for 15 long minutes. And Don Imus was very um, uh, complicit in all of the, the questions that he was asking him. And, and really, there was no point counterpoint to any of his um, comments. And then he appeared on Tucker Carlson's show on Fox News just last week. So um, we're looking at you know, different ways that we can help clarify the misinformation that, that um, RFK is spreading. Now, um, many of you also saw that there was a, a press conference um, that was held um, in, back in February with RFK Jr. and Robert De Niro. Now, what was supposed to happen was there was to be a Hill event where it was a big photo op with Robert De Niro who had been making various claims about the connection between vaccines and autism. Um, he has an autistic child himself. Um, you all remember there was a Tribeca Film Festival where that movie Vax was supposed to show, and um, it was actually pulled, and Robert De Niro ended up in the spotlight on that. Um, long story short, the day before the, he- the briefing on the Hill, they decided, um, this, the, um, the group decided to hold a press conference in the press club down in Washington, National Press Club in Washington, D.C. And to clarify, anyone can hold um, a meeting in the National Press Club. You just have to rent the room. 
Um, Robert De Niro was there. Uh, he barely said two words. I, I have to say it was the briefest comment I've ever heard. But RFK did go on for quite a long time, and so did the other um, folks like Del Bigtree that were there. But De Niro did not show up at the congressional briefing the next day, and there's been no word regarding why since then. Now, when all of this was bubbling up, um, there's been some really good response. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, different organizations that have been responding, and of course, social media um, activists have been terrific on this, really bringing forward the truth. Um, at the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics on January 10th, um, after Kennedy met with President-elect Trump, um, declared, put out an issue declaring that vaccines are safe, and they sent a letter to President Trump with over 350 national and state organizations that signed on to that. And I borrowed a slide. It's not showing in here. I'm not sure if it shows on the full screen. This slide is um, borrowed cur courtesy Pat Johnson from the Academy of Pediatrics. Um, but if you Google this, you'll be able to see this, this letter that came through. Um, some other issues uh, that have been coming up with regard to um, vaccine safety and oversight is the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. And um, that's the committee that does the investigations on um, different issues. And they have been, word is that they've been considering conducting um, an investigation of the CDC whistleblower allegation. And um, those are the allegations that were made by uh, Bill Thompson, who works at the CDC, um, who claimed that a study had been, um, that some children who should have been in a study looking at whether African-American children are affected um, by vaccines, um, I'm sorry, more clearly, whether or not African-American children are more likely to um, become autistic after an MMR vaccine or not. Um, he was claiming that some study, kids that should have been in the study were taken out. Um, what we have learned and what I believe to be true is that the children who were in that population, some of them were already autistic and therefore they couldn't be in a study that showed whether or not you would give them an MMR and then they'd become autistic. Um, so basically they had already um, been declared autistic and had wanted to get into some special service programs in Georgia and therefore had to go get vaccinated because they had not been vaccinated yet with MMR. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting conundrum we're in. So what's going on with that is um, we've done a couple different um, Q&As on that, and those are available on the links that you see here. Um, we did, a, we did an, our, um, a sign on letter as well, and it's signed on by several former CDC directors, HHS secretaries, et cetera, um, clarifying that African-American children do not, first of all, are not, not more frequently autistic than other children, and secondly, are not more inclined to become autistic from an MMR or any vaccination. But these things continue to bubble up. Um, there was an anti-vaccine rally um, hosted by Revolution, Revolution for Truth um, back on March 31st. It didn't get much publicity, and frankly, it really was more of an echo chamber than anything else. Um, on the good news front is we had the wonderful March for Science, and I'm so happy to have this webinar today on this issue. Um, we saw a lot of folks out there chanting and um, showing their support for vaccinations, and including Leah, who flew all the way from California to D.C. with Dr. Pan, so I'm sure she'll talk about that. Um, a couple things that I do want to clarify is that there are still disease outbreaks occurring in the U.S. So for the rest of my presentation, I'm, I'm going to cover some things that Every Child by Two has been trying to do with our partners to educate members of um, both the federal and state legislatures. Um, but the most important thing to clarify is that when you're talking to a legislator, you need to let them know that we're here for them. And they may be hearing from their very loud anti-vaccination constituents, but the crux of the matter is that there are millions of children who are saved every year by um, vaccinations. They're just not calling their offices. So they really need to know that their constituents do support them and that um, even though they're not getting constant phone calls, they need to keep them safe. And, um, you know, just a couple things that, to clarify, just in the past three years, we've had 904 Americans so, diagnosed with measles. There's actually an outbreak happening right this minute in Minnesota. And um, so far, there's 12 cases and 600 exposures, and many more to be coming down the pike. They're assuming it's going to last for several more months as more and more children become exposed to it who are not vaccinated. So um, this certainly is a case for the fact that measles is just a plain right array way, and it can really attack anyone. 
still dealing with pertussis, which is also called whooping cough. More than 60,000 people um, had whooping cough in the last few years. Um, and of course, it's incredibly dangerous for infants. We, of course, are still dealing with flu, and you know, people who say that flu isn't dangerous um, really have no idea that you know, 100 people, children die every year um, from flu, approximately, and those are 100 families that never recover um, from this devastation, and it's all because of what they think is going to be a simple flu case. Um, talking a little bit about the policies, I, I won't go into great, great detail on this, and I know some of our other speakers will do that, but um, when it comes to non-medical vaccine exemption laws, um, we know that different states are dealing with many, many different um, legislative battles this year, and there'll be some more on the, on the, um, on the legislature, legislative slate for next year. So the best thing that we want to do right now is to sort of figure out how we can galvanize, pull together all the information we need to support the immunization coalitions that are in every state in dealing with these different onslaughts. So um, what we're doing at Child by Two is we support what the coalitions or what the states would like to do. And so our policy on daycare and school mandates is that we do not believe anything other than medical exemptions are necessary. However, we do not say that a state should go forward now, right now, and try to move, remove your non-medical exemptions. Not every a state is in a good political environment to be doing that right now. Um, or they know that they may have a great legislator that's coming up and will be, you know, joining the legislature in a year or two who can help support them. So they have it on their, you know, on their list of things to do in the future. So there's a lot that goes into deciding it. And what I would say is if you're interested in helping in any way, you can always contact Every Child by Two and we will connect you with your um, immunization coalition in your state. Um, also, the vaccinefactsandpolicies.org website is a really great resource. That's the picture with the map. And they, um, they have really in-depth information on what's happening in the states. You can break it down by what laws are there, um, what their vaccination immunization rates are, et cetera, et cetera. So I do encourage folks to go to that. And the other thing I would say about exemption laws is remember that you don't want to get into a battle over whether or not you are um, infringing on someone's religious rights because the fact of the matter is, almost every religion supports vaccinations. The Christian scientists uh, do not, but there's, there's a large number of religions that have made wonderful statements about vaccinations. And so it's never a good idea to get into a battle over whether or not it's a religious issue. It's not a religious issue. Religions support vaccinations. It's really a matter of protecting the public health in public schools and in private schools so that children who are there have the right to stay safe from vaccine preventable diseases. So um, just some data on the overall attitudes for the public, and I think this is important. You can just keep this in your repertoire if you do want to reach out to your legislator. Um, I've shown this to a lot, of, a lot of legislators, just letting them know that there are people, they do want, people do want strong vaccination policies. 59% in this mock poll in 2015 strongly agreed, and 22% agreed. So basically over, you know, 75% of people, over 82% of people, sorry, um, felt that children in daycare should be vaccinated. vaccinated. And those who, um, in a scenario where one in four children were not up to date, 74% would consider removing their children. So we really have to keep in mind that we need to let them know that we're at, we have their back, that if they go forward and try to, you know, help secure tight restrictions on vaccination laws, they will have the support of the public. They may not notice it because it's a little quieter and we can help with that, but um, we need to let them know that overall people do support them. Um, uh, just one more issue I want to cover and then I'm going to try to bring it to a close for my other, um, for some other folks that have uh, wonderful stuff to tell you. Um, Every Child by Two um, worked very hard on a sign-on letter, and I know many of you who are on the call most likely put your name on this letter. Um, it was a letter to Congress regarding the funding for vaccinations. And with the Affordable Care Act going back and forth and back and forth, um, the crux of the matter is that vaccination funding is in jeopardy because while it used to be that 100% of it went through what's called the 317 line item, from Congress and then it went to CDC and then it went to the state to do all the activities that they need to do in support of vaccination. Now 50% of that money comes from what's called the Prevention and Public Health Fund. And in 
if we don't figure out a way to get that funding back over into the vaccine line item, whether we call it vaccines or 317, that money will be in jeopardy. And so what we've been doing is a really concerted effort to show legislators, legislators why we need to get that money back over and why we need to have annual funding that supports the real need for vaccinations. Um, we also did a letter that um, from, signed by 90 um, organizations to ask questions during um, Congressman Price's nomination for the Secretary of Health. And many organizations also sent in letters to members of Congress. We were really pleased to see that questions were actually asked during the hearing and even more were asked in writing. And um, Something that Every Child by Two is really proud of is right about the time when RFK was doing a lot of his uh, nonsense on the Hill, we worked very, very hard with the congressional champions um, in Congress. And by doing that, we drafted a letter, a Dear Colleague letter, that was signed. And it ended up being um, both bipartisan and bicameral. So it went through the House, the Senate, and it had signatures from both sides. And it talked about the power of life-saving vaccinations. And I think it really did a great job in, in really um, shoring up support and letting them know that even with all this craziness, craziness in the media, that there is support in general. I'm watching a couple questions on the right. Um, I don't want to stop quite yet, but um, if you see anything in particular that I should highlight, I will. I love seeing the chats going on, though. So, um, just real quickly, um, Vaccinate Your Family is Every Child by Two social media program, and we uh, launched back in 2005, and in doing so, we've created a really um, terrific opportunity to educate families about, and the, and the media and the press, about the need for vaccinations across the entire lifespan. And we have our website, of course, vaccinateyourfamily.org. And we have our pregnancy page. We have different sections, pregnancy, childhood, um, adolescent, and adult. Is our preteen, teen, adolescent. Um, so we talk about the real burdens of the diseases, and we really hone in on the data and the um, and the personal stories that you need to make a really compelling argument. So I would encourage you all to go there if you need anything when you're trying to write up an argument um, for your legislators. Um, and most specifically, what's a great resource for you is what we call our State of the Union campaign. And this was a year-long campaign to educate about the real burdens of diseases and the challenges that our country is facing. So we spent the whole year covering different diseases with social media graphics, and blog posts, and Facebook posts. And um, we had wonderful guest posts from folks from meningitis. And um, we just worked really hard on trying to get people to understand the real burdens of disease. And you can see a little more close up, the HPV infographic has a lot of details in there on data that you would need in making that argument. And there's our pertussis, one of our pertussis ones. And I know I'm kind of flying through these, but I know you'll see the presentation later if you'd like to hold it. Um, the final um, project that we did with the State of the Union was a report to the legislators. And um, this report came out actually the day of the Trump address to Congress. So we were really excited. It was really timely. And we had um, wonderful support from our fellow, um, from some congressional staffers who helped to share this with the entire um, Congress, both House and Senate. Um, our, also our partners at the Adult Vaccine Access Coalition shared it. And so we have um, breakdowns of the cost of preventable diseases. We have terrific policy resources in here. Um, basically, any organization that's working on immunization policies listed as a resource in here. Um, we broke it down with specific um, challenges to our to our um, maintaining and increasing rates. We talked about the measles cases that have been happening, the cost of the vaccine preventable diseases, things that legislators really want to know about. What's the real impact, and how is it impacting the bottom line for federal and our state level? These you can see talk about the incubation periods. These are the extra periods of time when families have to stay home to take care of sick children and themselves. And how long the herd immunity, how our herd immunity thresholds are lowering and how we have to make sure that we shore those up in order to make sure that we don't have more spreads of diseases. Um, so if you're looking for something and you need talking points, I encourage you to go to our State of the Union report. It's right on the Vaccinate Your Family page. Um, and of course, we're more than happy to, to send you any information you need. And we have a social media toolkit that's absolutely fantastic that goes with this. 
And that's um, pretty much it for our resources. This is the Every Child by Two um, rep website. We have um, a lot of different safety resources. The Protect Your Child is an ebook of diseases that breaks down every disease that you'd ever want to know about um, and talks about the real burdens to those to, about those diseases. And we have frequently asked question videos that are super popular in our organization. And um, we are right now the largest social media network. We're reaching about 11 million people annually with our messages. So if you have a message you want to get out, we're more than happy to help um, support getting that out to our followers. And I, you know, I do hope you'll follow our blog as well at shotofprevention.com. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Leah. Um, I think I'm next. So I am one of the founders of Vaccinate California, which is um, one of the groups that worked really hard to strengthen vaccine laws in the state of California. Um, and probably many of you are pretty familiar with that um, controversy and, and the process that we went through, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So um, this is how we started. Um, this is my, my son. That's the age he was at the time. Um, and in the late fall of 2014 and into the winter of 2015, um, it was just when he was old enough to finally get his first dose of MMR. And also um, when the first press reports about measles were starting to hit the um, the papers. And um, I, along with a whole bunch of other parents in the state of California, uh, were very concerned about that um, and were hearing, you know, in our local friend communities about people who weren't vaccinating. And so independently, a whole bunch of us were reaching out to our legislators to figure out what, what we could do to change the law and strengthen it. Um, in California a few years earlier, they had um, changed the law to require checking in with a physician or a licensed medical practitioner to hear the, um, the risks of not vaccinating before you could get a personal belief exemption from the requirements for school vaccines in the state of California. And that, that bill was called AB 2109. It was sponsored by Senator Dr. Pan, who represents the western part of Sacramento. And um, he's a pediatrician who became a politician. His um, reason for doing the bill was um, that he found the personal belief exemptions in the state of California were rising dramatically over time. He himself had treated measles cases back in 1991 in Philadelphia uh, when there was an outbreak among a particularly large pocket of people who refused to vaccinate. And so he had seen measles cases and seen children die. Um, so in that fight, in the AB 2109 fight, he worked primarily with um, pediatricians, public health officials, and um, the, the usual medical groups. Um, and uh, the debate ended up having parents with their children sort of on one side saying, I don't want to have to do this. I want to just be able to not vaccinate my kids. And that's my business. Don't bother me. And people on the other side wearing white coats and suits saying, it's not just your business. It's a public health issue. Um, and when the Disneyland measles outbreak began to spread across the state and he considered undertaking new legislation, he did not want to do that without parents and children and families on the same side as the white coats and suits. So when I called his office saying, why aren't you doing something about this? He said, well, will you help? So that led to this. Um, this is me and I uh, went to Sacramento the day they announced the legislation and I very deliberately wore a necklace that I had made myself. I carried my son in a hand-sewn, hand-dyed by me ring sling um, and showed that, you know, crunchy mamas support vaccines and believe that vaccines are a necessary part of public health. And um, there were a number of other moms there too, some dads, lots of toddlers, lots of infants, showing that um, 
we were on the same side as public health officials as well. So uh, we made a very deliberate choice to be front and center um, with our position as parents that we needed parents to be the voice of the pro-vaccine movement. It couldn't just be doctors in suits. It couldn't just be white coats and suits. Um, our position was never that people should be listening to us for the science, but they should be listening to the doctors, they should be listening to the immunologists and the researchers, but that politicians needed to know that their constituency, um, the majority of their constituencies would support them if they supported SB 277. So how did we build this coalition? How did we find people? who supported the idea of removing all non-medical exemptions. Um, most people vaccinate their kids and go about their business. They don't post about it on social media. They don't crow, hey, I vaccinated my kid. That's just not um, what we do for the most part. It's just you know, like brushing your teeth every morning. You don't post on social media, hey, I brushed my teeth today, look at me. Um, it's just something that we do because it's part of the preventative health care that we provide for our children. Um, but in order for us to secure this legislation, we needed to show that we were um, the majority of people and that we did support this legislation. So we needed to identify people who agreed with us and convince them to make phone calls to their legislature, to write letters to the editor of their local paper, to show up for hearings. So in order to do that, we identified a number of coalition members. Um, so the California State PTA, the California Medical Association, the California Immunization Coalition, um, people who'd been working on vaccines for a long time, the California Academy of Pediatrics. Something very interesting about the PTA in particular, it is a grassroots organization. It is absolutely on the ground. It does not take positions at the state or national level that are not brought to it by its coalition members, by its grassroots members rather. But national or um, having school mandates for vaccines nationwide was one of the founding purposes of the PTA. So it is very much part of its DNA, similar to the March of Dimes was founded to uh, fight for, I think it was the polio vaccine, um, although somebody will correct me if I'm wrong on that. So finding these organizations that you may not think of as being necessarily hardcore pro-vaccine, they're out there and they have tremendous resources in terms of membership. So we were able to work with these coalitions to say, okay, who has what kind of resources? Who has what kind of skills? What do they bring um, to the party? So um, PTA had this membership list. They also had a lobbyist in Sacramento. That meant that they had the ability to help us locate people in specific media markets, um, help us locate people who could go to county board of supervisors hearings on whether or not any individual county should endorse the bill. They could turn out people at hearings um, in Sacramento. Same for the Immunization Coalition and the, the California um, public health officials, their, uh, their network. So that really helped us leverage all of our affinity groups. And so we ended up with this really large coalition of affinity groups from across the state um, that helped us find people who agreed with us and convince them that, it, that they needed to act, that if they didn't act, um, California was going to continue to see this uptick in personal belief exemptions and that our communities would be further jeopardized. Um, so we, we were able to work with people to get them language that they could then put into their um, mailing lists and email to all their membership saying, this week, these are the phone calls we need you to make. These are the legislators who need to hear from you. Um, and we were able to use social media targeting to do that in um, specific areas. You can geolocate people who have already liked your page or people who are likely to like your page um, and try to get your message in front of specifically the location of people or the people with the kind of interests that you think might be interested in your page. So we, we were very careful about how we did that kind of stuff. We also were very fortunate that um, almost every single state paper uh, endorsed the bill in their editorial pages. So not just op-eds, but their editorial pages. So we were able to then 
take, for example, when we learned that there was one legislator who was kind of on the fence and she was um, the chair of a key committee that we needed to get through in order to enact the legislation, um, we were able to place op-eds in her local paper and we were able to print out the editorial by her local paper endorsing the bill and make a nice neat package along with letters from her constituents and hand deliver that to her office saying, this is really where your constituency is. Your constituency supports this bill. If you don't vote for this bill and there is another outbreak and it spreads through your community, your constituents are going to ask you why you voted against the bill. So we were able to use these networks that we built um, and the earned media that we had as opposed to paid media, but the, the um, editorials and op-eds and letters to the editor to really hone in on um, how to move our legislators toward the position we wanted them to have. So switching then to um, our messaging, one thing that we really learned, we tracked what was effective in getting people to make phone calls. We learned that showing big scary images of needles did not motivate people to pick up the phone. Showing happy, healthy kids, healthy, happy, healthy communities, those were the photographs that got shared. But even more than happy and healthy kids were vulnerable kids. If we showed photographs of vulnerable kids, and this is the child of one of our hardcore um, supporters, um, this photograph got shared more than almost any other photograph that we used. And so we could look at the metrics and realize, okay, this is this is the photo to use if you know we've, we've got something really important that we want um, to to hit a broad reach. So so we learned about messaging and we continually evaluated our messaging to make sure that it was hitting the people that we wanted it to hit and um, doing what we wanted it to do. Um, so again, we we worked on stories from our supporters. People would reach out to us and say, oh my God. You know, the work you're doing is fabulous. This is why it matters to me. And we say, great, can you turn that into an op-ed for your local paper? Can you turn that into a letter to your legislators that we can hand deliver? And, um, and that was very helpful for us. So um, we, this is just more of our imaging, again, showing these happy kids, showing um, across a spectrum of the community that there were people young and old who supported our bill. There were people of, um, different faiths, different colors, who really felt strongly that this legislation was an important thing to do to restore community immunity. Um, at the end, we were able to get letters from every single county in California, which if you know California at all, you know is not necessarily a given. We are not um, a homogenous state by any stretch of the imagination. And um, the opposition had a strong message with their you know, my child my choice message and that resonated with some of the more libertarian um, and conservative portions of our state some of the rural areas uh, so there were some republican legislators who said that they supported us in principle but could not support us because their constituency um, felt that it was um, too invasive into into parental rights we had a message that countered that, um, saying that it's also about our freedom to be able to send our children to school without fear of preventable disease and that there's no freedom in a hospital bed. Um, so, you know, we had counter messaging and we were able, using our, our network of, of coalition partners and affinity groups, to ultimately get support from every single county. The, the opposition was never able to do that. Um, we also tried to ensure that the messages about our side were not pictures of angry pro-vaxxers or um, making nasty comments about the other side, but rather, uh, you know, we, we, we tried to always take the high road. So when we made it through the assembly, we delivered cookies to every member of the assembly, thanking them for their yes vote. Um, or actually, I think we only delivered cookies to people who voted yes. I'm not actually sure about that. I don't remember the detail. But um, we had a reporter following us around as we delivered these cookies. And so we got some press coverage out of that. And that was, um, that was our message. We were really careful to um, keep our messaging very positive about what the bill would do in terms of protecting our community. We strongly believe um, 
that everyone who is concerned about what policy should be with respect to vaccines is coming from a place of protecting their children. Everybody in this debate loves their children and is acting in a manner consistent with being the best parent that they can be. Um, but unfortunately, some of those people um, are looking at a different set of facts and acting on a different set of facts. And that is motivating them to act in a way that um, is inconsistent with sound science and uh, thus jeopardizing the broader community. And, and that's why we felt we needed to do the legislation. So you can contrast the messaging that we had of you know people delivering cookies with angry um, opposition. And um, so we tried very hard to continually be respectful of the other side, even when um, sometimes it got very personal. Um, so one thing that anybody thinking of wading into the vaccine issue publicly needs to be aware of is that there are people on both sides, but um, on it, in, the, in the community of people who don't want to vaccinate their children, there are people who will target people who are very vocally pro-vaccine. Um, and that can be intimidating, that can be even scary when they take pictures of your children or pictures of you and splice them um, with footage of Nazis or um, comment um, on social media with um, things that sound like violent threats towards you or your children. Um, so it can be intimidating. And so before wading in, it's important to scrub your, pro your profiles and your personal media, personal social media, so that anything that's on there is something you're comfortable with having somebody who really doesn't like you see. Um, so it's important to, to be aware of that. It, for me, is not a reason not to act. For me, it, it underscores how important it is to act. Um, so that just means you have to protect yourself and grow a thick skin, which frankly for me is very challenging. Um, but in the end, at least with this law in California, we were successful. Um, and you know, consistent with our messaging, um, we pushed out thank yous again to the Senate, to the Assembly, to the governor, um, and to our supporters, reminding them that they were um, absolutely essential in changing public health policy in, in the state of California for the better. Um, I want to echo what Amy said about thinking carefully about what's right for your community. It may be that in some communities, um, it's not possible to eliminate all non-medical exemptions. It may also be not necessary. There may not be very, there may be some states where there aren't big pockets of vaccine resistance like we had in California. We have here several large communities, several entire schools. And when I say several, I mean more than 10, um, probably closer to 30 or 40 schools where the vaccination rate was below 50%. Um, and, and that is a public health risk, not just to the kids in that school, but if somebody in that school gets sick, it will spread to the other kids in that school and then spread throughout the community because it will hit a critical mass. And um, we, we had enough pockets like that that were big enough and spread throughout the state that we were very vulnerable to disease. And we saw that with the Disneyland outbreak. But there might be other states that aren't that vulnerable or there might be other states where um, the opposition is um, sufficiently organized um, and the pro-vaccine community is not sufficiently organized um, to really mount uh, a successful effort legislatively. We are here to help <laughs> if people want to talk about how to organize successfully in a community. Um, we are also um, very interested in helping people figure out what is possible in their community. It may be necessary, there, there are le there's pending legislation in several states, including um, Texas and New York. There's some legislation to make it easier to get personal belief exemptions. And um, I know there's a bill that's getting a hearing this week in Texas, for example. And um, it may be necessary to organize in much of it, in a similar manner to the way we did in order to prevent weakening of the laws. Um, and we're, we're very 
we're here, we're available um, in helping with that. And I know that Dr. Pan is also willing to speak to legislators who may become targets or who are willing to stand up publicly for vaccines and for strong public health laws so that he can help prepare them for what may come their way um, and help them be successful. Um, that's really all I had. Um, I just wanted to say we can do it. <laughs> um, it, it took a lot um, of work. It took a lot of amazing volunteers. We were very fortunate that um, we had some volunteers with some amazing skills. We had a person who was connected to the press community. She had been a press secretary for a state senator. We had somebody with a background in graphic design and web design who volunteered and did all of our graphics. We had another person who was very social media savvy and um, um, very versant in um, data analytics. And so she was able to really help our messaging and graphics be targeted and useful. Um, and, you know, that's just, that's just scratching the surface of the amount of resources that came to us through volunteers and uh, through our affinity groups. So, so my message to you is that everyone can be an advocate um, and there are lots of resources available to help. And um, we're here at vaccinatecalifornia.org. Um, Every Child by Two has an advocacy component, as does Voices for Vaccines, Secular Coalition um, as well. So we all have resources and we're all available to help or brainstorm with you. And that's all I had. And I didn't see any really specific questions in the chat, so I will pass it on to Karen. Okay, thank you so much, Leah. Oh, thank you. Um, and then thank you to Amy and to Sarah as well. Um, excuse me. Um, talking to you from Minnesota today, which is sort of, uh, as you heard, the center of a measles outbreak. And so this entire presentation is really very personal right now, as well as professional. So I want to thank all of you for being online and for sticking it out into uh, this last part. I want to talk to you today, if you imagine a camera moving out, um, from national with Amy to state with Leah, I want to talk to you about something that's very personal, and that's your own personal networks, the people that you um, have ready access to one-on-one. -on -one. And so I want to talk to you about the, the vaccine hesitancy among the people that you actually know. So what we know about vaccines is that they're very successful. Um, they've prevented, um, for children who've been vaccinated over the last two decades, they've prevented 322 million illnesses. 21 million hospitalizations, which is amazing. Being in the hospital as a child is always terrible. And um, 732,000 deaths. And uh, just as a reminder, this is what vaccines prevent. This is from our Why I Choose gallery. Uh, Michelle sent this to me because she wanted people to remember her son Xander, who died of pneumococcal disease in uh, 1999 before there was a pneumococcal vaccine available. And so whenever we think about the advocacy we do, we need to remember babies like Xander and that we're preventing other babies from having to suffer through the same terrible illnesses and um, complications um, and even death. Uh, despite the fact that we're preventing something that's important and that vaccines are very successful, we know that parents reject vaccines. In a 2016 study, 87% um, of pre pediatricians had parents refusing to vaccinate their children. And the year before, 93% uh, of pediatricians were asked to spread out or delay vaccines. Um, and really, spreading out and delaying vaccines is just another form of hesitancy. I always tell people there's really only two reasons why people delay or spread out vaccines. And the first is that they have concerns about vaccines. And the second is that their pediatrician looks like Rob Lowe and they want extra uh, extra time with him. So, um, you know, I, I'm assuming that it's mostly number one. Um, in any case, it is a, a hallmark of vaccine hesitancy. And when we think about vaccine hesitancy, we really need to see it on a spectrum. So on the one side, we have pro-vaccine people. These are people who would jump on a uh, conference call and listen to Amy and Leah and I, so we're the pro-vaccine brigade. But most parents are vaccine accepting. They vaccinate their kids, they walk away, they don't think about it again, they, you know, not really 
super engaged in talking about it. Um, and then that kind of blurs into vaccine hesitance. So varying degrees of vaccine hesitance from people who maybe are vaccinating and not feeling great about it to people who aren't vaccinating because they're really worried. And then at the very outer fringes, the very, very few anti-vaccine people, and these are people who really are genuinely against vaccines. And I really want to emphasize here that they're rare and that the people um, we want to focus on turning their their minds about vaccines is really that vaccine hesitant group, all the way from parents who are vaccinating and hesitant to parents who aren't vaccinating and hesitant. So I just want to go over really quickly the greatest hits of what are parents afraid of. So if you can understand a little bit about these vaccine fears, you can help counter them a little bit. Um, fears about vaccines are not new. When the first smallpox vaccine was uh, given, um, actually not the first one, but one of the first va smallpox vaccines was made from cowpox, which uh, was discovered because Edward Jenner noticed that children who, or not children, that milkmaids who worked with cows didn't get smallpox because they had built immunity by being exposed to cowpox. Um, people were refusing this vaccine because they were afraid they would turn into cows. Um, but uh, that didn't happen. Um, it, it's important, though, we see that as funny, but really it's not terribly different from the fears that parents have now, that this vaccine is going to change me in, or might change my children somehow or affect my children really terribly. And so the first concern I think that's always at the forefront is autism, and Amy handled um, <clears throat> the background about uh, Andrew Wakefield really perfectly, so I'm not going to say a ton about that. But I think it's really important to know that when we who are pro-vaccine are talking about autism, that we talk about not only that vaccines um, can't cause autism and don't cause autism, but that uh, autism isn't something to be afraid of, and that we stand with people who are autistic self-advocates and parents of autistic children, and we work to uh, accept them into our communities and to make our society better for them. So, and I, just another note, whenever I talk about vaccines not causing autism, um, if I put it in writing, I really try to put the word vaccines and autism, you're welcome, Liz, vaccines and autism as far away from each other as possible. So that's why this sentence is super clunky and horrible, but it's kind of the way I'd like to see people say this. Concerning vaccines, there is no correlation or mechanism of causation with autism. So that, that people don't put that together as well. Um, vaccine ingredients. So this is part of our, uh, everyone's afraid of what's in that. You know, are, are there um, subway um, yoga mats in my vaccines? I don't, I've never heard of that. But, you know, people are afraid of ingredients. Um, and so just a reminder that everything's made of chemicals and that vaccines are mostly, you know, water or saline with just micrograms of ingredients to help the body produce a, an immune response. Um, and, and also to sort of educate parents about how common these ingredients are that we encounter them sort of all the time. Um, so, you know, to speak up and say, yep, I've, I've heard of all of those things in vaccines and I'm still vaccinating because I feel gr great about, you know, putting those things in my body because I know it's, it's, there's small amounts and it's not going to hurt me. Um, too many too soon. And this is where we get people who are vaccine hesitant and space out those vaccines. So um, Leah talked about our, you know, our kids, our choice. This is, this graphic comes from their Facebook page. It's basically like, look at how many vaccines your kids have to get. Um, but really, what that is, is that's proof that we are preventing so many diseases. I mean, remember Xander. In 1999, he didn't have a pneumococcal vaccine. That wasn't available to me in, you know, a little bit before 1999. And, um, but it's available to my children, which is amazing. I am so grateful that my children can be protected against pneumococcal disease and that they can protect, be protected against Hib and that they can be protected against um, HPV, all of these amazing things, and that we should really speak about how grateful we are for the number of diseases we can prevent. And also to point out that the vaccine schedule really presents a much smaller immunological challenge to our children than the vaccine schedule did when we were children. In the 1980s, we there were 3,000 antigens in of in the entire vaccine schedule. Now it's about 130. So really vaccine technology has come along amazingly 
and these vaccines really present, the entire schedule presents less of an immunological challenge on than a baby would encounter on the first day of life, especially if you've got lots of grandmas kissing babies. Um, people are afraid that vaccines aren't natural. People love things to be natural. Um, you know, smallpox was natural, and that was terrible. But people love the idea of things that are natural. Um, remember that vaccines train the natural immune system, that they work with what's natural already. Um, and also, people misunderstand the immune system. The, there's two different immune systems. One's innate, and one's acquired. The innate immune system is the one that sees a germ and attacks it. And the acquired one is the one that remembers that it saw that germ before and remembers how to attack it. Um, and so just a reminder that you, you don't really want to boost your immune system. You can't boost your immune system. Um, my immune system boosts itself every spring uh, when it starts sneezing at all of the pollen in the air, which isn't really going to hurt me. It drives me nuts. If I were to boost my immune system, I would have more sneezing, more runny noses, more itchy eyes. That's not what I want. I want to actually tell my immune system to sort of shut up for a while that this isn't important. And so I, I take um, medication to make my immune system not freak out as much. So, you know, that, that's, that's another important thing to explain to people. And then also that vaccines aren't necessary, which is just awful. This is a graphic from the National Vaccine Information Center, which is an, the largest anti-vaccine group in the country um, and really tries to build itself as some sort of legitimate organization, which it is not. So, you know, to remember that measles killed 450 children a year, um, and that's, that's necessary to prevent. Chickenpox hospitalized 10,000 people a year in the U.S. before the vaccine, and that's necessary to prevent. And cervical cancer um, kills 4,000 women every year in the U.S. right now, and that's necessary to prevent. All of these things are important to prevent, especially to the people who could be one of those statistics. One of the ways that Voices for Vaccines works then, when we're trying to counter all of these reasons for vaccine hesitancy, is to uh, use social norming. Um, Oh, Amy, I think you're doing something to my screen. <laughs> social norming is really a way to um, social norming is a, is a way to um, have a real effect on your sorry. community. That's okay. <laughs> it all of a sudden got big. Have a real effect on your community. Um, in you want me to put back? I wanted it to be no, I, I can I'll, I'll just cope with it. it. Yeah, I'll just cope with it. I I can go with the flow, right? Um, so uh, let's talk about social norming. Oh, look, she's putting it back. Thank you, Amy. Um, the, the most predictive of a parent's vaccination decision was a percentage of their people network recommending nonconformity to the CDC schedule. This comes from a uh, study by Emily Brunson. Um, so what does that mean? That means that parent, you, can, you can predict whether or not a parent is going to vaccinate um, or vaccinate on time based on what the people they know in their real life tell them about the vaccine schedule, you know, don't vaccinate, don't do that vaccine, vaccine, vaccines are terrible, um, or vaccines are great. So what does this look like? If you are a parent vaccinating on schedule, most likely 87% or more of the people that you know, the doctors, your mom, your friends, the parents on the playground, your spouse, um, your religious leaders, the people you actually know are telling you, yep, I vaccinate on schedule. Um, parents who delay have 72% telling them, nope, I don't vaccinate on schedule. So this is what social norming means, is sort of what's normal for you. And remember that who we're connected to can skew our version of reality. So if we think of these on the left-hand side, the graphic on the left-hand side, if we think of the orange dots as being people who do vaccinate, you would probably say, well, th it should be the social norm in that community to vaccinate. That should be something that people are very comfortable doing. But if we look at the right um, graphic and the people that um, Miss Orange Dot there is actually connected to, she might start really questioning her vaccine decision because she is connected to some blue dots, to some people who aren't vaccinating. So what the social norm looks like for us personally might be different than what's real going on around us. And that's sort of what it means to be in a pocket of uh, vaccine refusal. So we need to make the vaccines the social norm in our communities. 
we need to make sure that any blue dots we have in our communities know that there are lots of orange dots around them and that they value vaccines. They see it as a, a community shared value, that this is something that we do. You know, I said I'm from Minnesota and I get quoted in the media every once in a while because I use a phrase that's very common in Minnesota. I say, you know, vaccinating is Minnesota nice. Um, getting diseases is not Minnesota nice. So, um, you know, that's that's how I look, hook it in with the values that are around me. Um, but there are other ways about um, openly discussing vaccines, thank you, Melody, um, in order to show people that it is the norm. Um, you have flu shot selfies, to take a shot of you with your Band-Aid um, and post it on social media is always fantastic. Um, to talk about um, outbreaks that are happening around you, I can tell you that pretty much everyone who sees me lately hears about measles and gets my opinion on measles and why we have measles circulating in Minnesota right now and what we can do about it and what they should do about it right now. Um, and also other news items. So, you know, um, you, great things that happen um, as far as, you know, a new flu vaccine, universal flu vaccine being worked on and all those things. And also to encourage other people, hey, you got your flu shot. Um, that's great. You should post about that. You know, just to, to say something really encouraging to people I think is important. So what happens, though, when you actually encounter a person who thinks that vaccines are terrible and they're going to turn their child into a cow? Um, or some other modern version of that. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is based on a toolkit that we lovingly crafted over many, 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 many months called Don't Hesitate Talking to Your Vaccine Hesitant Loved Ones with Compassion and Confidence. And um, it's available on our website, and I'll give you that link in a little bit. Um, but uh, if you're interested in this, you should download the toolkit um, for free and look over it. So the first thing is to understand is that parents need someone who listens. They really need some. They really need to feel like they were heard about their fears, about their experiences. And the problem is, is that if we don't listen, there is a very deep bench of people who are willing to pull up a chair and listen very closely, and then tell them that yes, vaccines are bad. Um, and these are a few of the Facebook groups I've found around Stop Mandatory Vaccination, Vaccine Safety Council of Minnesota, Vaccine Resistance Movement. Um, that Vaccine Resistance Movement is public if you ever want to take a look at what people, how people support and listen to each other as far as vaccines being bad. That's, that's a pretty good um, place to sort of, uh, I guess, peer into. So we really need to be people who listen. When someone comes to us and says, I'm worried about vaccines, we can say, will you tell me more about that? Um, instead of immediately jumping on them and explaining why they're wrong. Um, when we're listening, we need to really seek to understand, because usually there is something beneath the surface that makes someone hesitant to vaccines beyond something scary they heard. Um, and these are just six of the possible ways that a person could become vaccine hesitant. They might really want to be the person who is in control. And giving vaccines might feel like being out of control for them or uh, submitting to the regular vaccine schedule might feel overwhelming to them because someone else made it and they're not choosing it themselves. Um, they may also have an experience in their past um, where they had a bad healthcare experience, especially women who had bath, bad childbirth experiences may um, come to feel like, you know, healthcare is something that they need to know more about and they need to make their own choices about. Parenting styles also are important um, as far as vaccine, uh, vaccine decisions, especially since parenting styles now have a sort of tribal bent to them. So parents might feel like in order to fit in, they have to check all the boxes. You know, am I baby wearing? Am I using essential oils? Am I refusing to vaccinate? Do I have chickens in my backyard? Um, not that that's a particular parenting style, but they might feel like there's a checklist and not vaccinating is one of them. They might also distrust the government or public health people um, and really just feel like what the government's telling them is automatically suspect. They might be people who are bad at assessing risk 
or who have been given um, faulty data to lead them to believe that vaccines are riskier than the diseases they prevent. Or they might be a person who has some form of chemophobia, so they might be afraid of chemicals and uh, that really the vaccines being unsafe really resonates with them. Um, I, once you've figured out really where this person is landing, you can sort of craft your response. And I always encourage people to craft a response that's facts plus story. Um, stories are really important to give. Stories have a stickiness to them. They help people remember what's important. They, they really focus people's attentions on um, what we're doing. Um, and, and, you know, they, they're memorable. People will carry a story with them. Um, also, it's important to know that if you give people too much facts, if you try to debunk people too much, uh, t debunk people's uh, ideas too much, um, that can actually entrench that information. It's sort of like the vaccines don't cause autism. When you say vaccines don't cause autism, it's amazing, but parents will walk away from you and think, oh, well, maybe vaccines cause autism. That's somehow how they how they heard that. And that's just that's just human beings. That's not anything that's particular to people who are anti-vaccine. And so, um, you know. When someone says to you, oh, I, you know, I'm really afraid of chemicals, you know, you can say, you know, I, I can understand why you're afraid of chemicals. Um, and then focus on pre disease prevention. You know, um, I, what I'm afraid of is chicken pox, believe it or not. And I, I myself have personal stories about chicken pox that are, that are terrible. Um, but you might be afraid of a different disease or, you, you know, um, I distrust the government. Well, I distrust, you know, um, I distrust disease. Uh, ho however, you want to frame that. But this, um, this is the graphic I have here is um, from shotbyshot.org, which also has amazing stories of people who have survived diseases or who have been victims of diseases. I really encourage you to check out that website. And this is a picture of a, a poor little toddler who's got chicken pox and just looks miserable. And you can't help but look at that baby and think, oh, I just wish that you could have had a vaccine to prevent that. That would have been fa fabulous. Um, also use stories to help parents understand help parents understand risk. Uh, one of my favorite stories is actually a film called Someone You Love. It's at hpvepidemic.com. And uh, it's when parents are afraid of the HPV vaccine, I say, could you please watch this movie? It's a story of five women who had cervical cancer and had varying degrees of complications from that. So I really, you know, I, I watched that movie and then can we talk about that more and talk about your fears? So that's, uh, you know, I, I don't always use my own stories. Sometimes there are great stories out there. And remind parents that vaccines prevent diseases. I know that that sounds silly, um, but, you know, I think sometimes we get so lost in the weeds in vaccine advocacy that we forget that we're preventing you know, what's on the left is polio. And what's on the right, ironically, is actually from Minnesota. It's from the 2011 measles outbreak that got a number of us um, activated here. And uh, and here we are again. So, um, that you know, that's uh, we, we prevent real diseases. And they're really awful. And vaccines do good stuff. Um, but also, while you're doing this, you know, I'm talking to person, per, person to person, uh, advocacy, but social media is also person-to-person -person advocacy. So absolutely jump in online. Use use some of these tactics online as well. Um, and, you know, find your uh, pro -vac or pro science community. Um, start, start the conversations. Don't always jump into them. Be the brave one who says something, who says, I'm so glad I vaccinate my kids. I was so happy at the March for Science. I, I went to the March for Science in St. Paul, and I was so happy to see people I didn't even know existed who had signs about how grateful they were for vaccines. There were so many of those, and I just, my heart grew two sizes larger as though I had been the Grinch before. So it was fabulous. Um, and also, uh, uh, one key tactic is to go ahead and moderate your social media space space to your comfort. So um, if it's your private space, think of it that as being your living room. Would you let somebody say that to you in your living room? Or would you kick them out of your house? So, you know, if the answer to that is I would kick them out of the, your, my house, then, you know, go ahead and delete them, delete their comment or hide them or whatever you need to do. Um, if you're saying something in the public sphere, it's sort of if someone came up to you on the street and said that, how would you reply? Um, and so really uh, follow follow that inner thermometer um, 
that, that inner thermostat rather, and figure out what you're going to do. Alrighty, this is me. This is how you can contact me. That those tool, that toolkit I mentioned, and lots of other toolkits are available at voicesforvaccines.org/tools. We have a podcast, so if you really like listening to me talk, you can do it more. Um, and actually, we just published a new podcast today at vaxtalk.org. And then, um, if you're looking for a pro science group, you can join the Voices for Vaccines discussion forum. That's the last one. Facebook.com groups uh, VFE discussion. And that that is all. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Um, so I am up next. Um, I am going to go through this pretty quickly um, because uh, first of all, Leah actually touched on a lot of the points I wanted to talk about um, with some real live examples, which is uh, from her experience, which is even better. Um, and I really want to save some time for some questions at the end. Um, so now that you're equipped with the political landscape from Amy, the lessons learned from Leah's experience, and the awesome messaging advice from Karen, I kind of want to get you in the mindset to take all of this information, take all of these resources, and apply them and take action. Um, so just to start with, um, to get you in the mindset, I always tell people when it comes to lobbying, when it comes to advocacy and building relationships with your legislators, you have to remember that these people work for you. You pay their salaries with your taxpayer dollars. And so it's not just that you have a right to uh, have access to them and influence them and talk to them about what you want to see done in your community. It's also, I would argue, a civic duty because when if you're not out there telling your story uh, to your legislators about what you'd like to see done, someone else is going to fill that space and speak for you. Um, and that's unfortunately what I think we've seen in, um, uh, with, you know, we know that the anti-vax community or movement is uh, a minority, but they're a vocal minority that in some places are very well organized. Um, and so what we really need to do is to get what we know is the majority of Americans who support vaccines and understand how important they are to prevent uh, diseases to speak up and be more active and organized. Um, so just before before I wanted to before I start, remember that you are uh, you have the right, you have the duty as a constituent to talk to your legislators on a regular basis about the issues that are important to you. They work for you, they're there to represent you. So the first time that uh, you meet a legislator face to face, you might be a little nervous, um, but keep in mind that, um, and, and, and this could be their legis a legislator or their staff. Keep in mind that first of all, these are people and a lot of these meetings that I'm gonna kind of walk you through how to prepare for them um, and um, how, to, how to make that meeting as effective as possible. Um, it's just going to be a conversation. You are talking to a human being. Um, and, and it's also important to keep in mind, especially because I imagine there's a lot of scientists um, on this webinar, that you are subject matter experts. And legislators and their staff have a million things that they're trying to do, a million decisions they have to make. There's only so many issues that legislators and their staff can be experts in themselves and with everything else they can kind of only go so deep on a wide variety of issues and so you know legislators and their staff repeatedly say that the information they get from nonprofits that they get from subject matter experts is incredibly important and in, in influencing their decisions because again they can't be experts on every single issue and so you have a lot of power as a subject matter expert when you build a relationship with an office and establish yourself as a resource of information. And if you're not a subject matter expert, you know, you don't have to be a pediatrician um, or, or studying vaccines uh, to, to be uh, more of an expert than, you know, your typical staffer um, because you have all of these amazing resources from the organizations that presented today. Uh, we will be sending the slides around, by the way, um, so you'll be able to access those. Um, and so you can certainly become um, an expert if, if, if you don't feel you are right now. Um, so, oh, there we go. I'm not going to go too much into the difference between lobbying and advocacy. That's a really important distinction for nonprofits and uh, for government workers. Um, the, the most important thing to know about what lobbying is, is it's an attempt to influence decisions made by government officials. And the way that kind of differentiates from advocacy is when you're, when you're asking a legislator to 
vote a specific way on specific legislation than you're lobbying. If you're if you spend your entire meeting or phone call or letter talking about how you feel about an issue and how important that issue is and providing information, but you don't mention specific legislation, you're actually technically not doing any direct lobbying. Um, but as a constituent, again, you have a right to, to advocate um, and whether that is talking about specific legislation or not. And I imagine most people on this call are, are here as individuals. Um, if you want more information about lobbying as a C3, um, happy to provide resources. Um, if you want to contact me after. So there's a few different ways, and Leah talked about this, um, uh, that you can lobby. That's face-to-face, -face, email, phone calls, and of course, folks also can still write handwritten letters, and those are very powerful. Just know that when you send letters to Congress, uh, they do there is t a delay uh, because of security reasons and anthrax you know, concerns and those kinds of things. So they, they don't get there as timely. Um, in, in the ranking of things, there's nothing more powerful than a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, and, and what you're signaling when you, when you take the time to have a face-to-face -face meeting or make a phone call or write an email or personalized letter is that you're a voter that's going to show up on election day. You have to remember that every politician, every government official is always thinking about their next election. They want to get reelected. And so if they want to get reelected, they have to keep enough of their constituents happy. But the constituents they're more concerned about are the ones that they know are engaged and are going to actually show up on election day. So when you make that phone call, when you write that email, and especially when you show up to a meeting, you're signaling that you are watching them very closely, that you are an engaged citizen that is going to show up on election day, and therefore you're somebody they have to pay attention to. Um, and so that's why it's it's really uh, not enough, you know, as a lobbyist uh, to just say, well, the majority of Americans support vaccines. If you don't have a pro-vaccine community of advocates contacting that office, the polling is 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 great, but they want to know that, well, are there vaccine advocates that this is an issue that's important to them when they're considering who they're going to vote for? Um, so that's just kind of a little bit of, you know, just goes to show more of the point of showing up really matters. Writing those letters matters. And just a quick point on the responses you might get. I've heard a lot of people get really um, kind of, I guess, disappointed when they see a, a form letter, when they get something that looks like it's kind of a canned response. But as someone who, uh, you know, a while back was an intern in a, in a Senate office um, and, and talking to staffers and, and, and looking at them while I'm and observing them uh, while waiting to have meetings on the Hill, they do respond to every single piece of constituent communication. They have to. Um, and even if they're using kind of a form response, especially when it comes to a hot button issue, they, you know, if there's a vote coming up and they're getting tons and tons of calls on both sides, they will literally start tallying, you know, how many people call to say support, how many oppose. So that's just to say, just because you might get a, a form letter back doesn't mean that they just took, you know, they don't care or they didn't read it. Um, they did pay, they are paying attention. So just don't be discouraged by that. So legislators are always eager to win your support, um, and they really are interested in, in getting constituent views on, on legislation and issues um, because, of course, they're, they want to keep their constituents happy. So when you're preparing for a meeting, um, there's a few things you have to do uh, to make sure that it is effective as possible. Of course, you have to know the facts of, of what you're going to say, what you're going to talk about. Um, and this goes, you know, I'm talking about an in-person meeting, but this is the same thing goes for if you're going to write a letter or make a phone call. Um, it's just different formats of the same thing. You do want to know your facts and the main points you're going to get. Now, especially if you're a scientist, it's really important to make sure you don't get bogged down in the very nitty gritty details of the research um, because you're talking to a lay person who just wants to get the top bullet points that are going to be easy for them to consume and to share with their boss. Um, and so, you know, if you're if you have this urge to bring, you know, a 30 page <laughs> research paper, do not bring it. Um, if you're going to bring something for them to look at, try to keep it to one to two pages, keep it easy to read, um, and have kind of top line bullet points. You can always, 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 and you should offer to bring more information to them if they would like it. A big part of 
having these meetings, again, is to establish yourself as a resource, um, as someone who supports vaccines, but also someone that can get them more information and any information they might want about vaccines. Um, so that, you know, if they're hearing from the opposition, they want to hear what the other side has to say, they know that you're somebody that they can turn to for that information. It's really, really important to also know what the opposition is saying and have your counter argument. Um, knowing the history as well, especially for your specific state, and of course, knowing the legislators. So before you go into a meeting, you want to really know a little bit about the legislator, know their district, or you know if it's at the local level, what their what their county is like. Um, look at how they voted in the past on related issues. Uh, look at what committees they're on. So you want to be very cognizant of if are you meeting with a legislator that's on the health committee. Are you meeting with a legislator that's on the education committee? Because those are two committees that vaccine legislation usually goes through, health for obvious reasons and education, because as I think um, Leah mentioned earlier, um, or maybe it was Amy, uh, the, the vaccine uh, requirements go through schools. You know, they, that's, that's how this kind of was done, that you know, if you, if you, if you wanna get your kid into a public school, you have certain, uh, you have the vaccine requirements. So that's kind of the schools are sort of the arbiters of uh, vaccines. And so that that's usually a committee of jurisdiction that will look at a vaccine legislation. So knowing kind of what their district is like is going to be very helpful in tailoring your message. Uh, you know, and, and it's it's also going to give you a sense of maybe some of the objections and concerns they might have. So I think Leo was mentioning that in California there were pockets of kind of conservative libertarian uh, libertarian areas where um, there were legislators who supported the principle of, of vaccines, but they were very convinced uh, and, and they had constituents who were very convinced, uh, convinced by that sort of personal choice argument. So knowing that going in, if you're going to meet with a legislator that you know has a constituency like that, you're going to want to really prepare your talking points um, to tailor to that point of view and have kind of those counter arguments ready. So how do you actually schedule a meeting? Um, you, it's it's pretty simple, just how you schedule most things. You call the office, um, and you're usually going to get on the phone with a scheduler. You can also, of course, write an email. I always recommend when you when you do this to offer several dates and times. Uh, it makes it a little harder for them to say no, um, because you know you can say, well, can we meet on August fifth? Sorry, they're not they're not available. Well, you know, give them a few dates, and it's a little harder to say that. Um, you always, when you write a letter, uh, sorry, when you write an email or make a phone call to schedule a meeting, mention that you're a constituent. I'm a constituent. This is where I live because that's the first thing they want to know. Um, and that's going to perk their ears up as well. And also mention the issue that you want to discuss. So you know, my name is Sarah Levin. I uh, live on Apple Tree Street in, you know, this is my old address in Philadelphia. Uh, I'd like to have a meeting uh, with uh, the representative or his staff to discuss vaccines. Another thing um, when you get to the meeting, well, actually, let me not jump ahead. So a few kind of things to think about for the day of the meeting. Um, I always say dress as if you are going to an interview. Business casual is fine as well. Um, but this really shows that you're serious. Um, and um, maybe this is just for the Hill. Um, so, you know, I feel free to disagree with me. I think, um, you know, Leah made a really good point about presenting um, parents. Uh, you, I love that she said crunchy mamas support vaccines. Um, so, you know, I, 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 this, there may be an exception for this, especially if you're a group of parents to not dress in, you know, <laughs> suits and suits and ties and, and um, business wear. Um, I think this is probably more for the Hill. Uh, um, if you're here in DC at the state and local level, not necessarily. Um, always be on time, being early is great. Your demeanor is very, very important because we know that this is a really contentious issue. You may hear things um, in that meeting and concerns brought up that make you concerned, that make you angry. You always, always have to um, keep your cool and address any concerns that you hear um, calmly and offer to provide more information. But of course, you know, it sounds a little obvious. Um, but make sure not to ever be impolite or to sound angry or, or frustrated in a meeting. Um, always, if there's anything that you can thank that office for, 
um, a vote that they that they took that you agreed with, um, a speech that they made, um, really anything. Opening with a thank you is really really helpful. Um, so that's where that research beforehand of how this legislator has voted in the past, um, you know, the initiatives that they that they're promoting. If there's anything that you can thank them for, start the meeting with that um, and thank them for for whatever that is, because that really sets the tone for a positive meeting. Um, if you're going in a group, you want to decide beforehand who's going to be the primary speaker and who's going to talk about what, because you don't want a situation where you're talking over each other. Um, so, you know, you can kind of just practice beforehand, have a sense of who's going to talk about what, especially if you're going in a group and you have someone who has a really compelling personal story. For example, you know, a parent who has a young child uh, who's under 12 months and, you know, who's concerned about uh, other people in the community who are not vaccinated, um, putting their child in danger, having them speak and tell their personal story is really important. Um, so make sure that you save time for that um, and really make that a highlight of the meeting because, you know, again, these are human beings uh, and human beings are compelled by uh, personal stories. Um, and again, you're bringing constituents uh, to this office. And so if you're a constituent saying this personally impacts me, that, that really goes a long way to show why this legislator should care and take action about the issue. Oh, I already jumped ahead. Open with a thank you. Introduce yourself, again, as a constituent and, and the organization you're affiliated with. So the, the thing that's difficult about doing in-person meetings is that, unfortunately, you have to do them during business hours. So it's very difficult uh, for most people, you know, who work, you know, maybe nine to five jobs, um, to, to, to get this kind of meeting. So you may be part of, say, a pro-vaccine um, group in, in your community, but only, you know, two out of 30 people can actually go during the day to a meeting. Well, telling them that, you know, hi, my name is Sarah and I'm part of a pro-vaccine group and we meet every other week and there's 50 of us and we're all constituents of legislator so-and-so, that's really powerful. So even though not all 50 of you can go to this meeting, introducing your organization the affiliate, uh, and who you're affiliated with, and if you have some numbers, um, they're always interested in how many constituents you represent. Um, so just know that even if you're there by yourself or just a group of two or three people, if you're representing a larger organization of constituents, um, you can you can really have a lot of power in 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 just being there the two or three of you or even by yourself if you just uh make sure that you present that organization and especially if you have some numbers handy um, that can impress them uh, you start by saying well the reason i wanted to meet with you today and you go ahead into your talking points again share personal experiences um, and lead with that if you have them um, and then once you've kind of gone through your points Ask if they have any questions. Again, a big part of this isn't just saying, you know, hi, I'm here, I'm your constituent, and this is, you know, what we're here for to discuss. You want to establish yourself as a resource, as a subject matter expert. So ask them if they have any questions. Um, have you have have you had, you know, if you're talking to a staffer, have you had a chance to talk with the congressman um, about this issue? Um, have you been um, reached out to by any constituents? Are there any concerns that we could address? Um, and um, you you might hear some. Um, you might be able to um, answer and address any uh, concerns that the legislator has or the staffer has on the spot. Um, and a, an important thing to note, though, if they ever ask a question that you don't know the answer to, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. Never, never, ever fluff it. Never, ever lie. Just say, I'm not sure, I don't know, but I'm happy to find the answer and get back to you. That is, that's all you have to say. And it's not, it's not a bad thing. It doesn't look bad at all. In fact, it's really good to show, uh, it, really, it, it really shows your credibility that you want to only provide the best, most accurate information to this staffer. And so you just say, I don't know, I would be happy to get that information for you and make sure that you do follow up with that information. Um, I always bring a notebook with me to every meeting, take notes. Um, it shows that you're engaged and it helps you remember the kinds of things that you discussed, um, helpful information that you learned about that staffer or about the legislator in that meeting and any questions they have that you need to follow up on. At the end of the meeting, thank them again for their time. And if, you know, if, if there's something that you found that you thank them for at the beginning, thank them for that again. Um, and just remember that this is a conversation. 
Um, and you are, you know, if you, especially if you're a constituent or you're bringing constituents with you, you're, you're a VIP, you know, you're the kind of person that they want to impress because you're a voter. Um, so don't feel too nervous about it because you're, you're really an important person in that room. You're the important person in that room because you're a potential voter that they're, that they really want to be courteous and polite to, even if it's someone, um, you know, I, I on the completely opposite side of of you on the issue they will always be polite to you the follow-up okay so it's really important to think of this as a relationship you're building up a relationship so if you want to if you're if you're going to have a meeting this should not be the first and last meeting that you have or the last interaction and you don't always have to do in person but following up no more than two days later by email is absolutely fine um, even if it's just thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me if there's anything else I can do uh, to, to be helpful or to provide information uh, please let me know if there's any action items that the staffer the legislator committed to um, verbally uh, it's really good to have that in writing and say I really appreciated that you uh, uh, were willing to be more public about uh, your support for vaccines I'm looking forward to working with you to uh, you know advocate more um, to our community about this, you know, whatever was discussed, um, put that in writing, um, thank them for it, and follow up. Um, and then, of course, if there's a specific bill that you were advocating for, um, you know, always keep keep them updated, especially if they're not a legislator that's on the committee of jurisdiction. Um, you know, again, you want to be the resource on this issue. So always follow up by email, by phone call, have, have that in-person meeting, on a regular basis and I would argue this is something you should be doing with your federal your state and your local officials year-round you should be having communications with them um, and the more you do that the more power you have because again you're signaling that you're somebody that represents a community that is active and engaged and following and following what they're doing um, if you uh, Leah mentioned letters to the editor and op-eds if you have an op-ed published in their district or you know there's a uh, or a letter to the editor send it their way if there's something relevant that comes up um, send it to them because that again it, it keeps up the relationship it's kind of an excuse to touch base but it also kind of um, again positions you as that subject matter expert you're the one in the community who knows what's going on in this issue and you're serving as a resource by keeping them up to date um, with that, I am going to stop and um, first of all, thank all of our speakers for coming together and doing this and for everybody who stuck with us through this webinar. I do want to draw attention really quickly to um, our action alert. Um, so of course, this entire webinar is all about taking action. And so we made it super easy for you guys to do so right now. I just chatted the link to our action alert. And this makes it super easy because all you have to do is put your uh, address in and your name, and it will automatically populate a letter to your federal, state, um, and local legislators, as well as to President Trump. And it is a general letter that encourages um, your legislators and the president to support pro-vaccine policies. We have language in there for you, but it is editable. So if you have a personal story or something you'd like to add, please feel free and, and do make it personal. Um, but it will literally take you not even a minute or two to send it. Um, and this is a really good first step because you should receive a response um, from your legislators by email. And that's going to be a great first step to maybe requesting your meeting or making a phone call or following up by email again um, to, to see um, what, what they're willing to do to, to advance the cause. Um, so definitely take that action, share it with your friends, show off that you just took action. Um, and I'm going to stop there. We have this slide up so that you can take down our information and follow up with anything um, you might uh, want more information about. Um, and now we're going to open it up to um, any leftover questions. Any more questions?
Okay, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Thank you all so much. Please take action and stay in touch with us. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.